Carter Report presents worship from the Community Adventist Fellowship in Glendale, California. A special welcome to all of our viewers in North America and our new friends and churches in Russia. Today, you'll enjoy outstanding music and the preaching of the everlasting gospel by pastor, teacher, and evangelist John Carter. Please get your Bible and study the Word of God with us today. Thank you for joining us for Worship and Praise. Some years ago, when I was in the land of the Philippines, and I love the Filipino people, I find them such wonderful people, I had the privilege of visiting death row in this high security prison. We'd had a baptism in a, another prison in the morning, and some 300 Filipino prisoners had been baptized. But after that baptism, we were taken to this high security prison. It was like something out of the dark ages because when the guards took us to those old gates, those massive iron gates, instead of coming through the gates with us, the guards pushed us through the gates and just let us in. This prison was filled with such desperate men that these guards were not even game, didn't have the courage to go inside. We went inside simply because we didn't know they weren't going with us. But the reason we were not molested was because we were taken by a little group of Christians led by a, a tiny little Filipino lady who had been in this prison preaching the Word of God. Today, that's what I'm going to talk about, preaching the Word of God. The power in the preaching of the Word of God, that's the theme today. Then we were taken to a spot in this high security prison that was filled with gangs and on the floor of this tiny little Adventist chapel, Christian church, there was still a, a spot of blood because a prisoner who some weeks before had become a Christian was taken to, and he was in this church worshiping God, was, was murdered by some of the gang leaders and you could still see the blood staining the wood. Death Row was an unforgettable experience because right on Death Row there was a tiny little chapel. I had no idea what was going to happen, but when I went into this little chapel, I was asked to preach the prisoners a sermon. All of those prisoners were facing death in the electric chair. And when you talk to men who are dying, you don't talk platitudes and you don't talk about unimportant themes. Let me say this today. I'm talking to a group of people who are dying too. Every one of us is facing death. Every one of us. Maybe not in the electric chair, but one day, sooner or later. So I preached to those people on the gospel of Jesus and I told those prisoners that Jesus had gone to the electric chair already for them. And he was their sin bearer and he had died for them. And when I made an appeal for people to accept Jesus, a group of those Filipino prisoners who were soon to be executed stood up and, and gave their lives to Christ. There were in that congregation seven young men who knew the date of their execution. And those young men I was asked to baptize that day. I'll never forget going into the room, the adjoining room, into what appeared to be a filthy uh, latrine, a toilet, uh, with an awful stench. Uh, Beverly came with me and a little group of Australians because this was a team that had come from Sydney and from our church at Warunga, the division church in Australia. And there was a large tank, such like a horse tank, this font, you could call it, with about two feet of, of green water in it. Pastor Graham Bradford and I had the great privilege of, 
of getting over the side of this tank and into this filthy water. It was one of the greatest privileges I've ever had to get into that filthy water. And as each young Filipino got in, I said to him, why are you here? And he would say, sir, for murder. All of these men were communist uh, assassins who had murdered people. And I said, why are you here today? And each young man said, because I've heard about Jesus and I want to be in the kingdom of God. As I baptized each one of those Filipino criminals, now a child of God, as they came up out of the water, they did not want to get up out of the water. We had to baptize them on our knees because the water was so shallow. As they came up out of the water with their heads shaven in preparation for death, each one had a ringing testimony that he was ready to meet God because somebody had come to him and preached to him the gospel of Jesus. Now today I want to tell you this. I want every person here to understand this and so that you will have no doubt about what I'm saying. Listen to this. God's ordained means of saving the lost. You're listening to me? God's ordained means of saving the lost is through the preaching of the gospel in the word of God. This is God's way of saving the lost. I want you to know that when God devised a means whereby those Filipinos could be saved, God devised the way of sending a messenger with the gospel of Jesus. I want to say this because I don't want you to doubt what I'm going to say. I do not believe that people are saved simply because they are in darkness. That's a heresy I have to confront everywhere. People say, well, if they don't know, they're going to be saved. If that is so, the best thing that the Christian church can do is to keep them in darkness, and it seems to me we're doing a pretty good job at that. I do not believe that people are saved in ignorance because they are in darkness. I believe that people are saved because they come to Christ in the light. So I have a completely different viewpoint to some on salvation. I say it again, I do not believe that a person is saved because he's in darkness. I believe a person is saved because he's come to the light of the cross. And that's what the Bible teaches. I do not believe in that liberal viewpoint. I want you to come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21 and onwards. And I want you please to notice these great words by the Apostle Paul. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God, what does it say? Through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Bible says that God has got a way of saving men and women. It is through the foolishness of the message that is preached. You say, why does the Bible describe the message that is preached by the word foolishness? Because to the unrenewed human heart, the story of a Jew dying for the human race on the cross is the essence of foolishness. But it's not foolishness to God. Now notice verse 22. For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I want to tell you folks something today. Everybody listening here. The greatest honor in the world is not to be the president of the United States. That is a great honor. The greatest honor is not to be the Queen of England. That is a great privilege, I imagine. The greatest honor is not to sit in an office. I would consider personally that would be slavery. The greatest honor is not to have some great administrative post. 
the greatest honor that a man or a woman can have in this lifetime is to stand before a group of dying men and women and say, Thus saith the Lord. That's the greatest honor. I want you to come over now, please, to, to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Preaching has ever been God's way of saving the lost. God has always used this method because this was the plan of God. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. You'll notice the, the, the Christian era starts with preaching. Matthew chapter 3. And verse 1, and please turn to the passages. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And now if you come to chapter 4, and verse 15 and onwards, these are absolutely wonderful, thrilling words. The Bible says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. When those people were in darkness, they were in a lost condition. You hear what I'm saying? When those people were sitting in darkness, the Bible tells me that they were in a lost condition, but the Bible tells us that God sent them the light of Christ. And verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, listen to me, my beloved friends. God has always had his man, however dark the night has been, God has always had his man. Back in the days of the Pharisees, God had a man, his name was John, John the Baptist. And then after John the Baptist, the Bible says, Jesus came preaching. Can I say this softly if I have the capacity to say anything softly? It doesn't say that Jesus came counseling. It doesn't say that. I believe in counseling, but I would think that if preachers would preach, we'd need a lot less counseling. Hear this? The Bible doesn't say that John the Baptist came counseling. It doesn't say that Jesus came counseling. Whenever God has done, Jesse, whenever God has done a mighty work in this world, it is through a man or a woman preaching the Word of God. And when you read the history of the church, it doesn't matter what time the church was at, whether it, it, it was in a time of spiritual prosperity or in a time of spiritual death, God has always had his man. And his man maybe has come riding on the back of a horse like John Wesley, preaching 42,000 sermons, traveling 360,000 miles on the back of a horse, saving uh, 500,000 lost souls for Jesus, but John Wesley did not come in any other way but in the capacity of a preacher. Listen to me very carefully. If you would desire the chiefest gift, desire that you might have the privilege of preaching the Word of God. I tell you, my friend Fred, what a privilege Fred has had Last Sabbath we baptized 10 people who heard the word of God from the lips of Fred, one of our lay members in this church, because Fred came preaching Amen. the gospel of Jesus. I ask you today, what is the message to be preached? Would you come over here to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13? Let us talk about the gospel that saves the soul. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13 and we're going to talk now about the message that needs to be preached. Please notice these words by the greatest theologian and the greatest evangelist that this poor old world has ever seen. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse, verse 11 and onwards. Re Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh, by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. How does the Bible describe people in darkness, my friend? 
Uh, come on, please tell me, how does God describe the Gentile world or the world outside of the commonwealth of the children of God? The Bible says, without God and without hope in the world. I want to tell you this today, the person next door to you who doesn't know God is without hope at present, unless they get to know Jesus. I want to tell you the person you may be married to or your children without God are without hope without hope of everlasting life until they get to know Christ. This is a matter of life and death. Verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. I want to say today that the world without Christ is lost. Come over here to Romans chapter 3. I don't believe in that liberal nonsense that says that people are saved in darkness. The people are saved because they live up to the light they've got. I don't believe this. Because I don't believe a person can live up to the light he's got until he's got Christ in his heart. Now come here to Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now please, if you don't mind, say the words with me. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The Bible does not teach that we are born with salvation. The Bible tells us that we are born in a state of sin. And the Bible says, I want, this is a hard saying. It is very hard for a person who doesn't believe the Bible to believe these texts. But the Bible teaches that all the world outside of Christ is guilty before God. And the Bible teaches that the world is destined to the fires of hell. And that is why God has raised up men and raised up churches to preach the everlasting gospel. Because the only way that you can be saved and the only way that I can be saved is by accepting the word of God and by believing on Jesus. I want you to notice now three texts, three passages that plainly describe the nature of the gospel. The first passage is 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 16, please turn to it, dear hearts and gentle people. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. People say to me, why are you an evangelist? Because it's the highest calling. That is why. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It is the highest calling because it is dealing with the greatest issues, the issues of life and death. Now, if you don't have a Bible, uh, see if you can get one because there are Bibles around the church. And while you're going to be blessed without a Bible, you'll get a double blessing with one. Uh, 1 Timothy, dear folks, chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That's the first passage. Now come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 and onwards. So that uh, uh, passage, that verse in Timothy tells us that Jesus came down to this earth as a real man and he lived among us, but he was received up into glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And so the Bible tells the story of the Son of God who becomes the Son of Man, who has a perfect life, and who dies for our sins on the cross. And he goes down into the tomb, but he's raised from the dead. Now come over now to Hebrews chapter 9, and it goes on and tells us a little more of the plan of redemption. Please come over now to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And this talks about the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is our high priest. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 and 12 and 28. The Bible says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come 
with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. Say the words, having obtained eternal redemption. He is our high priest. And verse 28 says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Now listen carefully. I want to give you now seven great truths of salvation. Number one, his astounding incarnation. Number two, his sinless life. Number three, his atoning sacrifice. Number four, his glorious resurrection. Number five, his triumphant ascension. Number six, his powerful intercession. Number seven, his victorious consummation. He will come again and take his people to heaven. Now, in all of those great aspects, we have the plan of redemption. And while I have not tried to exhaust the plan of redemption, I would say, my friend, what we have spoken about so far is the very heart of salvation. That Jesus, God's Son, came down to this earth. That is his wonderful incarnation. He lived a perfect life among men. He had no sin separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. On the cross, he became our sin bearer. He made a perfect atoning sacrifice for our sins. He went down into the grave, but he had a, a glorious resurrection. He had a triumphant ascension. He is now our powerful high priest. As I'm talking to you today, we have a priest in glory who intercedes for us. And the Bible says he is going to have a magnificent consummation when he comes again and finishes the plan of redemption and takes us home to glory. Amen. That is the heart of the message that the preacher is to preach. And the preacher is to go to the lost and say, believe in this gospel. I say to you today, if you're a part of the lost, believe in this gospel. Then the Bible says, believe and accept and repent and be baptized and then walk the Christian life as the fruitage of the gospel. And so that is the message that is to go to the world. Christ has come. Christ has died for our sins on the cross. And we who are under the curse of the law and who are doomed to eternal death, we can live and we can have everlasting life. And so that is why I say to you today, whether you are an ordained pastor, or as they use that term, unfortunately, a lay person, if you are called and every person is called to proclaim this gospel, if you do this, that is the greatest work that's ever been committed to the sons of men. It is the highest calling. It is God's way of saving the lost. I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to give you now some snapshots of God at work. And the first story I'm going to tell uh, is especially for the Filipinos who are here today. The Filipinos are a very important part of the ministry of this church. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of running a large campaign in the city of Manila. What a blessing it was. We took with us, Beverly and I took with us from our church in Australia, 73 young Australians who wanted to have her to dip their hands into the power of God, who were tired of religiosity and pomposity and hypocrisy and who wanted to see the power of God in a very special way. Uh, when we opened in the Philippines, we opened the meetings in the Filipino International Conference Center which is the finest building in the, in the Far East. And the people did not come by the hundreds, they came by the tens of the thousands. The Filipinos are some of the best people in the world to preach to. And the Philippines is ripe for the harvest of God. And I can remember uh, the national television company owned by the Marcus family on that occasion, sent along a television crew. They came to the meetings night after night to televise the meetings. 
And when I was interviewed on the program, Good Morning Manila, not Good Morning America, but Good Morning Manila, I can remember the interviewer turning to me and he said, Pastor Carter, I notice in the advertising that I have received at the meetings that you're going to speak on the Antichrist, the man with the number 666. Now, I believe, my friend, that there is a great place in evangelism for the preaching of the Bible prophecies. Because the Bible prophecies uplift Jesus and the Bible prophecies also unmask the Antichrist. And in the three angels' messages, Jesse, we are told to preach a full message. Not just a part of a message, but a full message. And he turned to me and he said, tell me, Pastor Carter, who is the Antichrist? I said, my friend, I do not think it would be appropriate here on national television to talk about the Antichrist. He said, are you going to talk about it tonight? And I said, by the grace of God. And when Beverly and I left the Filipino International Plaza, this hotel, overlooking Manila Bay, and when we rode in a little Filipino taxi to the great theater, we could not even approach the street. Oh, I wish I could take some of the cynics from the Western world into some of these countries where God is working, and he wants to work here too, but what we're doing here in America and in Australia, we are quenching the spirit by our infidelity and our unbelief. We think we're smart. In fact, we're just dumb, spiritually dumb. When people say evangelism doesn't work, it's true. It probably doesn't work for them because they don't have the spirit. But in the Philippines, the people for that meeting that night, they were there by the thousands and the thousands. And when we stepped out of our taxi, immediately we were met by four young Filipino soldiers with submachine guns. And uh, we were taken through the halls of this great complex. And as we came in, I have seen some great things, but this was one of the greatest. As I came into this great theater that seated 6,600 people, which was an appropriate number, there were guards standing around the sides with submachine guns. They were checking every person that night uh, with metal detectors. And before I preached that night, I wasn't going to tell you this, but I went to Beverly and I said, now, if I get shot tonight, uh, and we weren't joking, Helen. We were absolutely serious. I said, if I should get shot tonight, uh, we've got to accept this as God's will. And when I walked out in that audience, the place was packed by the people who comprise the Church of the Antichrist, packed to the doors. As I preached that night, the Spirit of God came down upon me like a heavy cloak. I could feel Him come on me. And the Spirit of God moved in the audience. And as I spoke on the Bible prophecies and unmasked the Antichrist and called the Filipino people to rise up and break the shackles of religious intolerance. There was a tremendous solemnity over the great audience. The place was filled. The Marcus family, or some of them sat down the front. Captains and generals, and admirals, many Roman Catholic priests and nuns in their, in their distinctive dress. God bless them. And after the meeting, I wondered what was going to happen. I'll tell you what happened the whole audience stood to its feet and broke out into applause. Cried out, thank God, thank God, thank God. The, before that meeting started, the police came to me and they said, Pastor Carter, we can't start the meeting. We'll have to delay it because there are so many people standing outside and we're afraid they're going to batter down the doors. And so they gave me a, a megaphone, a loud hailer, an amplifier, and they took me to the doors, opened the doors, and when I looked out, I thought I was in Ephesus with the Apostle Paul. The people were as far as the eye could see. Beautiful Filipino girls, uh, people getting, this was the cream of society that had come. It was raining, a soft, gentle rain, and they were standing in the rain. They had been there since 3 o'clock that afternoon. It was then 8 o'clock at night, waiting for five hours. I said, 
My beloved Filipino friends, I've been told by the police that you must disperse and go home because the theater is completely filled. The people said to me, we will not go home until we hear the word of the Lord. I said, if you can wait for another two hours, we'll have another session. We started the next session at 10 o'clock, and I preached through until 12 o'clock. Then the people had to get in their cars. Some had to get in jeepneys and buses and travel half the night to get home. I want to tell you folks something. There's power in the Word of God. I know there's power in the Word of God because, quite frankly, I have seen it. I know that Jesus is alive. When we had the baptism there in the Philippines, I stood there beside a great swimming pool, and uh, we baptized at the, at the conclusion of that campaign 2,200 wonderful souls. I want to tell you today, my friend, this gospel we talk about is not a mamby-pamby thing. I want you to come over here to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I have a number of stories I'm going to tell you, and these stories are going to bless you today, and they're going to put a fire in your soul. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, come on, everybody say it loud. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want to take you now to my, home, my homeland. I want to take you to a city that has many precious memories for Beverly and myself, and that is the capital of the state of Victoria down in the south. That is the city of Melbourne. We were asked to run a series of meetings there, and for the first time in the history of the church, possibly in the world, we used television commercials, 30-second television commercials that we had shot in the Middle East. People told us, and we've heard it, wherever we've gone, the people won't come because the day of evangelism is finished. We hear it wherever we go from the cynics. The most religious will tell you that. I'll never forget when we opened in the great Dallas Brooks Hall in downtown Melbourne with six identical sessions, and there was not a spare seat. Six sessions, the biggest theater. I can think because Melbourne is cold and wet. It's always raining in Melbourne. It's like an English town. It's a university city. It's a beautiful city. And as we would drive into the Dallas Brooks, we would think to ourselves, as we drove through the rain and the sleet, will anybody be there tonight? Every night for six months, which lengthened into 12 months, and then into two years, the place was packed to the doors with the most sophisticated people. At the end of that campaign, we saw just on 600 brand new people baptized. Glory be to God. Now, it is easier to baptize in some countries. It is easier at present to baptize in Russia than in Australia. It is hard to baptize in Australia. It is easier to baptize in America than in Australia. It's about three or four or five times harder to run a campaign in Australia than it is here in America. America is basically one of the easiest places in the world. I can think one night in the Dallas Brooks when I spoke on spiritism, the great theater was packed. I've had the experience, and I say this humbly, because if I didn't say it humbly, I'd be afraid of what God might do to me. But I've had the experience of before a meeting feeling fatigued, very tired because of the pressure of the work, and I've had the experience of walking out on the stage as tired as can be and feeling something fall on me. And immediately I am filled with power and the words flow out of my mouth. That's the Spirit of God. Amen. I have felt the anointing of the Spirit. And the night when I spoke on the strange world of the occult, the place was packed to the doors and the people were hanging off the rafters and I can remember one family came in dressed in black, wearing robes, because they were the leading spiritualists of Melbourne. He was the leader 
of these people who are in touch with Satan. It's very hard to win spiritists. And that night, I preached with all my heart. And I wondered, will these people, will, will they respond to this message? You wonder, what, wonder that. As you're preaching, you're looking at people in the audience and you're wondering, are these people listening or have they turned their minds off? Because people sit in church, religious people particularly, and turn their minds off, particularly when you're getting close to them. And as I was preaching that night and preaching on spiritism, these people looked up every text. And then the next meeting, they came again. And when I made an appeal for people to accept Christ and to turn from spiritism, they got on their feet and came down the front. And some weeks later, I had the privilege on the stage of the Dallas Brooks of baptizing their great family into Christ and into God's church. I want to tell you, my friend, there is power in the preaching of the Word of God. I want to say to the preachers, preachers who are listening here today, I want you to know that I'm a preacher with you, but I want to say this to you, the church would be a hundred times stronger and our churches would not be dying if we preachers would only get back to the preaching of the Bible. I want you to come over here to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1 down to 3, dear hearts and gentle people. Isaiah 61, and verses 1 down to 3. And these are the words that Jesus used to describe his own ministry, but in a sense they apply to every preacher. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now let me say this, if you're a preacher, don't preach unless he's on you. You can't preach with power unless the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you. And I want to say the Spirit of the Lord God can come upon a woman just as much as upon a man. Hear this? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them, look, look at this, beauty for ashes. Wouldn't you like that? The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. One of the greatest things that ever came to me, this poor preacher, was the day when I preached with my father in the audience. My father, as far as the word of God is concerned, was an unbeliever. He was a pagan. Uh, his father came from the south of Ireland. His name was Timothy Tui. Uh, at least on the other side, on his mother's side. Timothy Tui. And so he was brought up in, in the very bosom of, of false religion. And my father had no faith in God. He'd never read the Bible. He knew a lot about church. In Australia, when he was a boy, he was the youngest altar boy under Bishop uh, Dewey, yeah, who later became the, uh, the archbishop for the, all of that part of Australia. And my father could say the Mass in Latin. He used to amuse us as, as kids by going through the Mass and saying it all in Latin. My father knew the Mass, a lot, like a lot of us know the church manual. Like a lot of us know about the creeds of the church, but my father did not know Christ. And my father was an unhappy man. He used to curse and swear, and when he'd get really mad, and that was quite often, he would start to break up the furniture. So I come from a home that was an unhappy home, but I want to tell you, I'm not a victim. You're only a victim if you feel sorry for yourself. I'm a redeemed child of God, and God has given me the victory. I'm not a victim. I'm victorious in Jesus. I get sick of this nonsense that everybody's a victim, don't you? Women are victims. Every race is a victim. I ought to be a victim, I guess, because I'm a minority. I'm an Australian. I'm a real victim. What a lot of nonsense. Don't talk to me about it. My father 
was an unbeliever. And my dad came along to a series of meetings I was running. My father opposed my becoming a minister. He didn't want me to be a minister. He said, be anything but a minister. And when my father would come and hear me preach, he would listen to me. And I can remember one night I was preaching Beverly in a big tent. There's no place as good as a tent. I love the smell of the canvas. I have preached in huge tents, tents that hold thousands and thousands of people. I have preached in tents in storms. I have preached in tents with water running six, in six inches through the tent and the people having to put their feet up on the seats because the water was rushing. I preached in tents with the lightning so strong uh, that, that the tent was quaking and shaking and the water was coming down the center poles. I preached in a tent in Sydney with seven big poles and the water was coming down and hitting the light bulbs and they were bursting. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> I can remember when I was preaching and preaching on the gospel and the good news about Jesus, my father sat in the audience and listened. And when I made an appeal for people to come to Christ, my old Irish, unbelieving, bad-tempered, cursing father stood up and came forward and was baptized. Glory be to God. That probably was the most exciting campaign I've ever run. I can think of another campaign that I had the privilege of running with Beverly because she's been there in every campaign. Our first campaign was in a little town by the name of Parks on the outer Baku where the church is a few and men of religion are scanty on a path seldom crossed say by folks that are lost one McGinnis McGee had a shanty. It was that sort of town. I know the whole poem but it's not suitable for church. I can remember here we were preaching in parks and we saw the power of the gospel. But I want to tell you about Papua New Guinea. That was a, a place that was uh, looked after by Australia for many years. It was like a protectorate. And then Australia gave to Papua, Papua New Guinea its, its sovereignty and, and still basically keeps its budget going. When Beverly and I went up at, at an invitation of the church to preach in Papua New Guinea, we hired this great big outdoor stadium. It would seat as many as could come. And we say that in the city of Port Moresby, we say this to the glory of God, we had the largest crowds in the history of the nation. And we saw the people of God. We saw the power of God. We saw the people of God as they came to Christ. And I can remember visiting, I don't know if you came with me, but we went along and invited Sir Julius Chan, the Prime Minister. We went to see him at his suite at Parliament House. And I said, Sir Julius, and he was not what you'd call a Christian. I said, Sir Julius, I'd like to ask you to come to my meetings. He was the Prime Minister, like the President. And he said, uh, we're working on the cabinet appointments and we're working on the budget. I don't know if I can come. I said, I want you to come. I'm asking you to come as the Prime Minister. He said, Pastor Carter, I'll try to come. And the next night was the last night. And we didn't know he was going to come, come but he came with an uh, entourage, heaps of motor cars. And we had a crowd that was so great that it was as far as the eye could see. People had even climbed up trees to hear the word of God. And Sir, Sir Julius Chan, the Prime Minister, came up the front. And when he came up the front, I tell you folks, I have courage in these things because I've seen the power of God. And when he came up on the stage, he lifted his hands. He said, I've never seen a crowd like this in my life. He said, we can't get crowds like these for political rallies. I said, no, of course not. Because we have the power of God here, Sir Julius. And then he thanked me for coming to his nation. And I preached that night and I finished the meeting by telling the story of John 3.16. But some of you folks have heard me preach before know the story off by heart about the little boy. It sure can make a dirty boy clean. Great story. And I made an appeal. And when I made an appeal, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea stood to his feet and raised his hands. The next day, I was due to fly back to Sydney, and the telephone rang. It was the secretary of the prime minister, 
and he said, the Prime Minister wants to see you. Can he come and see you? I said, no, we'll come and see him. So we got in our car, we drove to his suite. Magnificent, wasn't it? As we got out of the, the lift or the elevator, the Prime Minister's staff were waiting to meet us and they lined up in an honor guard for us. And we walked along this honor guard and he stood at the end of the honor guard and he put his arms around me and he took us into his, his living room and he leaned across and took my white hand and his black hand and looked me in the eye and said, Pastor Carter, I want to tell you something. He said, after the meeting last night, I went home and I searched in the Bible for that passage. I said to my, my aide, find good old John 3.16 that Pastor Carter spoke about. He said, I've been reading it. And then he touched his heart and he said, Pastor Carter, this is the Prime Minister of a nation talking. He said, when you spoke about John 3.16, it touched me here. He said, I need John 3.16. And then he said, why is it that we've heard so little from you people? Why aren't you running campaigns like these around the world? And then holding my hand, he said, I'm asking you, please come back. He said, if you come back, I'll take you in my personal jet to any part of this nation and I will hire the halls and I'll introduce you because my people need to hear the message of John 3.16. There's power in the Word. I tell you, the Gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And we saw it, I might add, at the Shrine Auditorium too, folks. Some of you here today. Let me tell you about Africa. I don't know which story is the greatest story. I've been to places like Jamaica. I've had the privilege of preaching in Baghdad, running a series of meetings in Baghdad, just down from the palace of Saddam Hussein. I've had the privilege of running meetings in Cairo, the land of the pyramids. I've had the privilege of running in Germany, running meetings in Germany and old Britain. And of course, Jamaica in Kingston town. In Africa, what an experience. I love Africa. We went to Salisbury, Rhodesia, which today is called Harare, Zimbabwe. There we hired the Harare International Conference Center that seated eight times more than this church. A great theater. The best theater on the continent of Africa. Can I tell you this? When we went there, I say this softly, and we spoke to some of the believers. You know what they said to us? Nobody's going to come. <laughs> they said, nobody will come for biblical archaeology. On the opening night, the crowds were so great, there were traffic jams for five miles around the theater. As we preached the word, by the second or the third week, I was into the Bible prophecies. And those of you who've heard me preach the message, I try to preach it all. And I preached on Daniel 7, on the Antichrist. And when I preached on Daniel 7 with these great blackboards, 40 feet of blackboards, I wrote up the identification marks of the Antichrist. I did not say who the Antichrist was. I did not need to because the Bible tells you very plainly. It is a power that comes up on the ruins of the Roman Empire, overthrows three kings, changes the law of God, persecutes the people of God, is seated uh, in, in a city with seven hills. And so I just wrote up these things. Uh, the, the place was so packed there was hardly room to, for a person to stand. They were seated on the seats. They were out in the foyer, thousands and thousands of, of wonderful African people. And the next day, when I woke up, it was to the, a knocking on the door, and some of our young people came in and shook me, and they said, you're on the headlines of the national newspaper. The bishops of that great organization have called an emergency meeting, and they've said, he's talking about us. They said, we've looked at the identification marks, and there's only one power that fulfills it, and that's us, and we've got to get him out of the country. And so... The controversy became so intense, it was taken to the floor of Parliament. It was debated on the floor of Parliament. 
It was reported on the BBC across England and in Australia on the ABC and on the South African press, uh, television, and also throughout Germany and other parts of the world. And every day it was headlines on the newspaper, what will we do with this man? Now you may think, those things don't concern me. We spent a lot of time praying because we did not know if somebody would try to shoot us down. I'll never forget the great night in the great theater in Arari, Zimbabwe. We've been there twice now. Went back the next year to greater crowds because by that time we were famous. We say that humbly, it is true. And that night when I went to this great theater, it was packed and the people were singing. And I knew we'd reached a crisis because the government had sent a member of the cabinet to speak to the audience. I wondered, what on earth is going to happen? Will I be deported tonight? And so that night was the meeting on the Mark of the Beast. <laughs> and before I went out on the stage, we had the young men from Seleucy College, our Adventist College, on the next to the sands of the Kilahari, where we've also taken meetings. I asked them to come up the front, and we had a fine young black minister, and he led that huge audience in the singing of the African National Anthem. I've never heard anything like it. You folks have heard nothing like it. It goes for 15 minutes, and the women trill up high, and the men harmonize, and uh, this young black stood up the front, held my microphone, and led this tremendous audience. These meetings were being televised by national television, too. And after, he, uh, after they'd finished, we just stood there. We felt we've never heard singing like this. And then the cabinet member said, Pastor Carter, I can delay no longer. I must go and speak to the crowd. And we wondered. All of the brethren were wondering, too. They thought, what's this guy got us into? Everything was so quiet here until he came. And so this man came out, and he said, I've been sent by Mr. Mugabe and the cabinet and the parliament. You've come here as a visitor to our country. Let me tell you folks something. If you don't get opposition in your preaching, it's because your preaching isn't worth opposing. Whenever there is great preaching, there'll be great opposition. And I do not glorify an opposition, but I'm glad when I get it because it shows I must be doing at least something right. That's why I believe the devil's mad with us here. Hear that? That's why a lot of people are mad with us here. Because the word is being preached. And the devil doesn't like the preaching of the word. I don't care what the devil thinks. And so he came out. He took the microphone. He said, Pastor Carter, you've come to this country as a missionary. We can think of other missionaries who've come to our country like David Livingston. I felt proud. Felt proud. He said, you've come as a missionary. He said, you may not know it, but I've been in the meeting every night listening to you, and I want to say you haven't attacked anybody. You've only preached the word of God. Now he said the Mugabe government, this was a Marxist government, has sent me to give you a message. He said, I now come as a spokesman for the Mugabe government. And then he said this, he made the sign of the cross as an Anglican would. He said, in the name of the Father... In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, we charge you, preach the Word, preach the Word, preach the Word. 